I just don't talk to the spirits that help me. I talk to the ancestors. And when I call on the ancestors, I always ask them to help me convey this message in a good way that you find understanding in what I'm trying to tell you, that you grasp onto it, that you respect it. I ask the Creator and the ancestors to help me give you that message that you will understand the sacredness of what we are about to do. You know, each individual journey, it's your journey. You, you can't drag all these people with you. When you're walking that alone, you're walking it alone. The only way for you to truly comprehend it is to come into a ceremony. Put your camera aside, put your fear aside, put all of that aside and just be human and come in and experience it. No matter how difficult it is, that's the only way. In the 16th century, European navigators, explorers of new territories, pointed the bow of their ships towards the west. Hidden behind thick curtains of fog, the first lands to be seen were those of the island of Newfoundland. 500 years later, the climate on these steep coasts hasn't changed much, but what about its inhabitants? The story they tell is fascinating and complex. A long time ago, this island was called a different name than what it's called now. We refer to this island as Takumkuk, and they don't say Newfoundland. It only became Newfoundland when John Cabot came here in 1497. And he, because he was looking for new lands, and he found this land, they call it Newfoundland. And what we call it Takumkuk. And that means this is our land. When the French Dutch and British set foot on this island. The local indigenous population were living in nomadic tribes, moving around the land according to the seasons without fences or borders. But for the Europeans, steeped in individual values and notions of private property, keen to discover and conquer, it is primarily the huge schools of cod spawning along the coast which encouraged them to settle here and to found the town of St. John's. Since this time, fishing boats have never stopped going back and forth from the port, which has now become industrial. A few miles from the capital, out of sight and away from the swell, the little port of Petty Harbor watches the icebergs coming down from the North Pole pass by.
45 years that I've been at it, it was like, just amazing. Just amazing to have the opportunity to go on the water. You know, the water gets rough some days and it's, it just changes overall, all the time, right? And then the beauty of our island, go to drive around our coastline and stuff like that, is amazing. My family is here like 200 years, and uh, that's how they ever known this fish, right since they came from Ireland. When they, when they migrated over here, they, they fished, they settled here, and they fished, that's how they don't. Like when I, when I wanted to become a fisherman, I just go out and you pay $20 for a license and, and get a boat and lines and go fishing. Now, it's like $200,000. Whoever comes to this community to fish, got to fish the way we do, right? With hook and line. They're not allowed to bring in gillnets, bigger or big trials or anything like that, right? So you got to be like one, one fish at a time coming in the boat. They have three lines out, but you're only allowed to haul in uh, one fish at a time, right? Like my father and, and his father, they, they fought to get that. So that, that was important. Without that uh, agreement that they had, they would have wiped it out here. They would have destroyed the fishing grounds with nets and stuff, right? Like other places, any other place around the island, they're allowed to use gill nets, right? And, and trials and stuff like that, right? But we, we don't here. Once that's stopped, uh, we, give, we give up doing it. It's gonna be gone. It's gonna, it's gonna die. It's gonna, there's nobody else who's gonna be interested in doing it, right? So we're very, very uh, passionate about passing our knowledge along, right? And like, just like my father passed it to me and his father passed it to him. So, and same with everybody in the community. You got it? Yeah. You gotta uh, love it here, you know, in order to uh, stick it out here. It's a, it's a, it's a rough, it's a rough spot to live. You know, it's a winter time. It's really cold, and then the ice comes up, the pack ice from from uh, Labrador, because Labrador is uh, freezing cold all the time, and then all that ice travels from Labrador. Like t t today, we got a. Uh, northerly winds, so that pushes the ice down from Labrador, pushes it down south. There's some places on this island, south of here, is a place called uh, St. Shots. They often had uh, 92 days straight of fog. 92 days straight, nothing else on the fog, no sunlight, no nothing. So, a place like that is depressing to live. I just love it here. I just like, it's like heaven. <laughs> now, I think if uh, people say, oh, die and go to heaven, I'm in heaven. To me, it's like, you know, 
it's peaceful and it's a uh, it's, it's not a, a stressful life here you know some people just can't do it they'll go there and they'll they'll it's not worth it they're, they're not making enough money they just they, uh, stay going and they just uh they'll move on to other jobs right you know but it's not all about money it's all about contentment too right so I mean, if you can get enough to pay your few bills and you got enough to eat there's no other, no better life than it you know in my opinion right i could be wrong With the passing generations, the people from European descent have shaped small communities along the coast, mixing a cultural heritage from the old continent with the harshness of a local way of life which revolves around the sea. In the adversity of these places, these people are indomitable and fight to stay that way. So people belong in, in, a, in a culture and then somebody comes in and tells them, like, oh, your culture's gone now, you get to, you get to start something new. It's very, very hard to adjust to that, right? Especially the, the Inuit. They could live in an igloo or they could live in a fucking tent, you know, right out in the wilderness area. So the government took them then and bought them in, built houses for them and said live in houses. And uh, they didn't want it. They were forced to do it. So there was a tremendous change uh, to their life culture, right? And uh, they, they don't have to commit a suicide. Look at the nice and cork and everything. Look at that. The government said to uh, us people here in Pretty Harbor, we all got to move to St. John's. There's no more Pretty Harbor. The community is going to be shut down. Uh, there's no more fishing here. You got to move to St. John's. A resettlement, right? Uh, it would be a shock. Like, that a lot of people wouldn't be able to handle, right? And they'd done that here in Newfoundland. They, 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 because there was all these communities settled everywhere, all around, and and the government uh, wanted to resettle them. Said, oh, you know, you move off that island, you're to this small little place you're at, and move into the to the big city. When trust is established. It does not take long for the conversation to turn towards memories of wounds which are still very much alive. The problem of uprooting affects a large part of the population of Newfoundland in one way or another, be they descendants of the settlers or indigenous. I leave the coast and head into the territory to meet a discreet indigenous community, the Mi'kmaq. Con River is a reserve one day's travel from St. John's. It is entirely inhabited and administered by the Mi'kmaq. On this territory, everyone shares the same history, a history which unites them today. In 1749, a governor in, in Nova Scotia uh, issued a, a proclamation that said every living Mi'kmaq person in Atlantic Canada was to be shot on sight, men, women, and children. And for the first year that happened, it was 10 pounds sterling. I don't know how much money that is, but I would imagine in the 1700s, it was a lot of money. The second year was 15 pounds sterling. And the, the third year was 20 pounds sterling for every skill brought back of a Mi'kmaq person. I, uh, I started falling in love with the country when I was in my, uh, in my teens, growing up. And uh, then uh, eventually, I eventually, on my own, 
I don't mind getting up in the middle of the night and leaving my house and going through my trap line. And I spend 20 some odd days, probably 30 days on my trap line by myself. It all means that I guess I'm at home. When I go in on the country, I'm at home. When I'm in the woods, I'm at home. So it means I'm, I'm at home when I'm in the woods. I, I'm proud to walk on my land. Well, like I said, we're keepers off the land. So we'll go in and we'll keep track of the caribou. We count them. We'll see people doing things that they're not supposed to be doing to the animals. We'll go and tell them, you know, you know, stop them. We report them. We, we haven't got the law to arrest them, but we should, but we don't. And so we just are, we're just the keepers off the land. That's all we are. And we'll make sure that, you know, it's kept clean. The garbage is picked up and the animals are safe. And this we, uh, to, we could do, to our ability, we could just do it. The British government set up a reserve here in, in 1870. So we actually lived on a reserve that was set up by the British colony. So there was no problem identifying us. We had no choice. Not that we wanted one, but on the outside world, outside other parts of Newfoundland, became a thing of fear. I'm proud to call my land, but you know, I got to ask the province, so could I go out and get a moose for myself? But my grandfathers and my ancestors didn't have to do that. If I get caught harvesting a moose for myself, they would charge me for poaching. As a Mi'kmaq person, I, I don't consider it poaching. I'm getting food for myself, food for my family. Although we could run the store anytime we want to, to get food, but the part of our, our culture that we live off of wild meat most of my life. And that's, that's brilliant to me. That's brilliant to all the people that, that live on the reserve. I guess you look at it the other way. I, I, I'm talking about all this is my land and everything around here, and now I talk about going out and killing an animal. I kill it because I need it. And as my, my, as, as make them all people, I'll treat that animal with respect when I put them on the ground. I, I'm not sitting on and taking pictures. I'm not strapping these, the head to my bonnet, my truck. I'm not you know, jumping for joy because I got a moose. And I don't shoot that animal just for the sport of it. I kill it because it's there for me to harvest as, to get food as a mega mall person. incredible place that we live, it, it's, if you go back 200 years, this place would have been like a grocery store. It all, it had, had many species of, of fish in the rivers. I, it was only a day's walk to go to the land to hunt caribou or, or beaver or other animals. So when our people landed in this place, it's, it's like we're home. The grocery store is right here. We have no fresh salmon in our rivers. Now, uh, people are blaming uh, fish farmers. They're blaming the oil companies. They're bringing invasive species to, the, to this land that, that we never had before. All those things are part of what we deal with every day.
Soldier boy, soldier boy, ah, 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 the Mi'kmaq are particularly suspicious of strangers. They will only engage with you after being assured that you are well-meaning in regard to their culture. After which the doors open slightly, giving access to the rites and the customary practices reserved for the community, during which all cameras are generally prohibited. I consider myself lucky in being able to record these moments. The powwow is an annual gathering where the local people are invited to come together to pay homage to their ancestors. It's also the time chosen to revive the forgotten rites and practices. We had to go more or less underground and we had to hide what we were doing. That's why it wasn't so visible for a long time. There were laws made preventing us from practicing our ceremonies. There were laws imposed upon us that denied our language, denied our culture, denied the ceremony. And if we did ceremony, we were in jail, you know, put in jail or prisoned or uh, severely reprimanded in some way, you know. They, they would punish our people for doing Every person that's in this community is my family. And I often say to people outside that maybe don't understand, I've got 800 children that I look after, or 1,000 children that I look after. We, we make our own world here in Maui Bukik. This is our world, and we make this as traditional as we can. Both Mi'kmaq and Canadian, half and half. Makes us feel good that we're Canadian, we're First Nations Mi'kmaq, and yeah. just makes us feel good. And we could tell like all our like outside friends, and they tells me you should embrace your culture, and I'm like, thank you, and thank you, and it really you know helps me you know be proud of who I am. <laughs> Pow is for people to gather, to gather, like I said, but it's to gather around and watch us do what we do, right? Maybe it looks like a show because people's looking, looking at dancers, but really they're just there to learn and just learn and how, how the people express their culture. I, I don't think it's a show at all. If it's a show, well, you should be selling tickets, but it's a show. I got to learn that the drum is the heartbeat of Mother Earth in our Mi'kmaq culture, but when I hit the drum, I don't feel nothing special. I just, I just does it because it's fun and it makes people smile. Our people need to understand this. They don't truly understand themselves if they can't understand this. What this is, and what it represents, and how far back it goes historically, this is something that all our people need to understand. The thing is different is the technology that I say everyone don't want to participate in our culture anymore. They just want to go ahead, play video games, just stay in home all the time and 
stuff like that. And back then, they didn't have that. So all they did was they fishing, trapping with their parents, grandparents getting stories and all that. And Pop told, I, my grandfather told me a couple stories and he took me on trapping, trapping adventures and all that. But, but when I grew up, I didn't like, I didn't, I got more interested in technology and all that and going out with friends, but I didn't, didn't like keep going trapping adventures with my grandfather and all that. Back when I was growing up, we had no electricity. We had no television. We didn't even have a radio. So the only entertainment we had was uh, storytelling and being on land with your grandparents or your parents. And they were teaching you things in a Mi'kmaq way that you had no idea that you were being taught until much later in life when you realized that I recognized those things because my grandfather told me it was good for me. The modern way of, of life is so new to us. Everybody was like being locked in the candy store for a while. We, we all want a car, we all want a snow machine. Uh, we all want the four wheelers. We want that. Spiritually, yes, it does a lot for me, you know, I mean, in regards to uh, being on the land, uh, hunting, fishing, uh, trapping, I mean, uh, whatever I do, I mean, it's a uh, it's connection that, uh, I, I, I don't know, I can't explain because it's such a, such a, a good feeling. For me, like I say, it, it's something that I have myself, but I mean, I should be sharing it more because I had, an, uh, you know, I had an opportunity in life to learn all these things from my uncle, and it's only fitting and right to, you know, pass this on. So, you know, so the younger ones need to uh, hear about it and see it and do it, you know, so to understand where we come from. They're so lost in or swallowed up in today's world. It's so fast paced, it's so much going on that they're losing that connection. And so it's like myself and other people, especially parents, we need to get them, you know, at least introduce them to it and see if they like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. Well, I mean, I, I've, I've been around long enough to, uh, you know, see both sides of it. And my own take on that is that uh, even though, you know, culture is everything, you know, we we're promoting it and we're doing what we can into the schools. We're doing the uh, language. We do the drumming, the dancing. You know, we, we do a lot of the, uh, the traditional stuff and, you know, country and fishing and that. But modern world, sad, sad to say, but modern world's going to win out. You know, unless something drastically changes, I mean, uh, especially at home. I grew up being a Catholic and everything else, and uh, as the years went on, I mean, we tried to, uh, well, we're, where we are, reconnecting with, you know, culture and tradition and that, so that's why you see stuff now like, you know, sweats and uh, smudging and stuff being brought back. But for me growing up, uh, I only saw like, you know, going to church and praying and stuff like that because my mom and dad did it. So did Hunko and his family and all that, so. I believe in uh, a lot of the traditional stuff like the smudging and uh, stuff. And I also believe in the uh, Catholic way. So, you know, I, I, I've kind of tried to get my balance with both of it. You know, I don't believe in either one of it more or less, you know, so, so both of it I use when it's, you know, for my own well-being. If I need to pray, I pray. If I need to have a smudge, I have a smudge. Uh, as of right now, I mean, my uncle's passed. And even now, when I go on the country or I go on the river or I go out in the boat, I mean, I have that connection with him. I, like I said, I hear him in the wind, I see him in the sky when I see the eagle, you know, and that kind of stuff. So everything I do, you know, kind of reminds me of him. When I'm moose hunting, when I, you know, whatever I'm doing, it's stuff that we did together. So it, brings back a lot of good memories.
they're sharing the spiritual aspect, and they really respect it here. Really, truly respect it here. Most of this community don't take part in ceremony. You know, they're, they're, they've been Christianized for so long, and they don't understand that the, that journey that we go on to un, to be able to use this and take this. To respect uh, the people is what we're doing today. And when we when we dance at a powwow, we're dancing for our ancestors. We're praying for our ancestors. We're welcoming our ancestors. The spirits of our ancestors be part of our of our celebration. And prayers that you say uh, daily prayers is done in the sense of thanking the ancestors for all that they've given us. Without them, we couldn't be here. So they play that role every day in our lives. Without ancestors, there'd be no us. In this culture under reconstruction, the new generations crystallize all their hopes. Without them really realizing it, the renaissance of a culture, which has almost disappeared, rests entirely on their shoulders. Regaining the identity of the Mi'kmaq people by restoring their rights, their practices, and their language is an ambitious project slowly growing in people's minds. Like when we go to cities, we can smell a lot of pollution, but in here, we don't smell that. There's like barely any garbage and stuff, hardly of us, like smoke and stuff, so I'd rather here. Um, and freedom. You could do a lot more things, and there's no one to tell you what to do because you're on your own. And yeah, that's it. Ready? Both of them can't say nothing. The only words they can say is mukwa. That's it. And that's no. They never grew up with the classes we had. Uh, the classes we had only started recently. Uh, only in like the 2000s it started. So it was very, very recent that we started learning it in our school. That's why they can't speak it. Don't burn yourself. The language. The language of our people is missing. Every, every person over there that are Mi'kmaq people should be speaking the language. The language was outlawed by the church back in 1921. So that freedom is gone, was gone, and it's now coming back. But today, it, it, our first language has become English. And we have to overcome that one. We have to teach our tongue that to speak another language, we have to teach our mind, our body, to speak the language. The difficult part for us now is um, to regain all of those things and to teach our children all of those things and to take, teach our families all of those things. It, it have to come automatic. It can be done. It just takes a little time. cut down a tree. That's like saying sorry to Mother Nature. That's what we, that's what kind of drumming is about. And we sang the honor song to honor our ancestors. Um, the elders represent wisdom 
and they've been here longer bef before there was any technology and this is what they used to do for fun and and they do this with their parents too that know more <laughs> And a lot of that will come from the younger children in the school who's learning about those things that we never learned about. So those are the people that are going to bring us into that, that future that we only dream about now. Plants and the, the trees are all had names. The, the rivers had names like people. The mountains had names like people. So that's how I grew up, and, and that's what we need to regain again in some way to bring that heart and soul back to the people again. Has, deserves the same respect as a person, as a human being. This ground deserves the same respect. The plants and the medicine deserves the same respect. It's done in with respect, and it's the same thing with coming here to this community. The first white man landed on the shores, we were always having to uh, make sure that everything's protected, everything's spiritually protected, and, and that's why we, uh, we, we do this, is to help our people have that connection and have that protection that they need, that our ancestors watch over us all the time.
now coming back to a traditional way of life again, where we now practice our culture, our traditions, language. So we've taken control of our lives again in many ways. We now are driving the car ourselves. So now we know where we want to go and how we want to get there. We now speak to government on our own behalf. We don't need people to do it for us. We, we are no longer uh, forbidden by law to practice our traditions. In a sense, I guess what, what, what's happened to us is that the governments and the church and the, um, the armies, uh, they can take away your pride and your dignity, but they can't give it back. You have to take it back. And that's what we've been able to do here in this community. We've taken back our pride and our dignity. We want to drive our own car. We don't need someone to do it for us. But there are things that we need to share that happen within this, in this, that we need to share. And the only way for you to truly experience it is to come in. If you got a chance, like I said, don't be scared. There are a lot of good lodge keepers here in this community right now. Just coming in here and filming in this lodge is uh, what I what we refer to as taboo. But there are things that we, as the Mi'kmaq people, as a spiritual people, have to be willing to share. And that's the knowledge of these lodges. My first time when I came out of the sweat lodge, my very first sweat lodge I went to was in Cape Breton in Eskazoni. There was a gentleman come up from South Dakota, Sioux, he was Sioux, Dakota Sioux. He come up to show our people the lodge. He brought the sweat lodge to our people. The very first one I ever saw, he brought it. When we come in, we, we were all jammed in there. We were shoulder to shoulder, packed. The lodge was smaller than this, probably about up to here, because we only had that much room from the pit to sit. 17 of us, shoulder to shoulder in there. He sat right by the door. He was the one who was pouring the water. And as he poured the water, you know, they brought in all the grandfathers, one round, 24 of them. They brought them all in. It was, the pile was up to here, red hot. It's like you could feel that heat just hitting you, the radiation of that heat. You know, it was so hot. And that's even before the door closed, before he put on the water. And when he put on the water, he just laughed at us, told us to pray. He didn't tell us what to pray for or who to pray for. He just told us to pray. Sat there, I screamed and cried, no, no doubt. I was very, very, I was in a lot of pain. The lodge was so hot. And when he opened up, a couple of the men jumped out and didn't want to come back. I sat there and I was thinking, this, this man is not going to cook me out. This man is not going to do this to me. I'm going to uh, pray harder, I <laughs> figured, and make it true. And I did. Even though I got all red blotches on me, cooked, I could feel my pulse just jumping on my neck like that. But when I crawled out after that ceremony was done, I, and I was weak and dizzy and I stood up, I was almost falling over, I was so weak. And I looked up, I could see the steam coming off my shoulders, just rising up into the heavens. The sky was 
stars everywhere. Beautiful, cold October night. Beautiful. And I knew that moment, through all that pain and misery I just come out of, I knew this is what I've been missing in my life. I knew this was part of me. At that stage in my life, I, want, I wanted to die. I wanted to commit suicide. I tried many times. And I made a promise to myself and Creator that that night I was going to try to leave the drugs and the, my bad stuff alone and move forward into, in, into this. I broke protocol bringing you into this lodge. I'm letting you guys know right now I'm going to get some slack for this. And that was my commitment. I had to carry the pipe and I had to carry the lodge and carry those teachings and be able to share these teachings.